This is the day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Let's welcome the Holy Spirit to help us. Precious Holy Spirit, we never want to take for granted the privilege we have of access to your presence. So we just invite you in our lives right now, wherever we are, to connect us together and breathe on the Word of God that it might, Lord, be triggered and activated in our hearts. Every promise of God that it might bear fruit and lasting fruit, Father, so that so many people around us might be blessed from even the blessings that you're pouring into our life. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. We're talking about casting your care and we're getting into part two. If you didn't get part one, oh, I just want to encourage you. Make sure you get on our website and get a little bit of a review. But part two of casting your care, and we're talking about the promotion that God gives us from casting our care. You see, it's so important for you and I to realize that we're not alone. My friend, you're not alone. Even your struggles, your worries, and your anxieties, the things that make you feel so isolated and alone, it's not just you. You're not alone. And God's not mad at you. God's not looking to punish you. This isn't your lot in life. Even many great leaders, influencers, and world changers have felt exactly what you're feeling right now. Do you know Thomas Jefferson? He said this, he said, how much pain they have cost the evils which have never happened. Dwight D. Eisenhower, the 34th president, he said, worry is a word that I don't allow myself to use. Why would he say that? Because he knows the, the contamination, the viral effect of worry. Zig Ziglar, he said this, difficult roads often lead to beautiful destinations. The best is yet to come. So we shouldn't shun the difficult roads, but we should ask for God to join us, to help us, to lead us. My mom, one of the greatest influencers in my life and mentors in my life, she would often tell me, even as a boy, she would say, stop your worrying, Stephen. I told you I was a professional worrier. My mom would say, stop your worrying, Stephen. God loves us and he will take care of us. So casting your care. Is that for some people, but maybe not for others? Maybe it's not for you. Is casting your care something that God says, hey, you know, you should try this, but it's optional. If you're really a responsible person, you know, you might want to do it, but I'll just give you grace to be troubled and worried. Ah, I don't think so. And you know, it's not true. It's not optional. It's God's direction and how we are to humble ourselves. We're called to cast our care. Every one of us, doesn't matter who you are doesn't matter how old you are. We all have to practice casting our care upon him because he cares for us. Let's remind ourselves of that word again in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. And we learn that comma right there is so important. Comma, not period. The idea is still rolling. Verse 7, casting all your care on him, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all, for he, God, cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Oh, that's so good to know. God doesn't fail. God doesn't fall asleep holding your cares and somehow things go crooked. God takes care of business. We learn that the Greek word for care is merimna. That's translated into care and actually means by worried distraction, you are drawn, pulled in different directions. You're torn apart. Man, that does, no wonder God says, cast your cares on me. It's almost like quick, 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 get your cares. And we talked about the lid being on the gift that God has for you. Remember, 1 Peter 5, it says that humble yourselves that he may exalt you. But how do you do that? By casting all your cares on him. And the lid of all these cares being on your head, you've got to cast over on him. And then you're under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. You might say, well, what was happening before I cast the care? God couldn't exalt you because you had chosen something else to be on your head, something to be your authority, the cares, the worries, the anxiety that were controlling your life. I mean, you know they control your life. And God's saying, no, no, don't let those control your life. Put those over on me, no matter how noble they seem to be. 
put them over on me and put yourself under my hand and let me put that smile on your face and let me lift you, promote you. Yes, that word exalt, that word's in there. Who hasn't got a phone call or an email or a text and felt that sinking, heavy, troubled feeling of care not only distract but begin to pull you apart internally, mentally, even emotionally? It's sadly such a common affliction that just crushes people, destroys their health, even sabotages their life. Have you ever noticed that care seems to come along the very moment you try to focus on going forward, being positive, trying to help somebody else, pursuing God's truth? Have you noticed it just comes along right on time? Why is that? Remember, built right into the full meaning of the word care is distraction, pulled in different directions, worry, anxiety, fretting. Care is meant to break your focus, your positive focus. And so it can then break you. And then you become no use to even the people that you care about. Regardless of how noble your care is, no matter how saintly the focus of your care is, it will pull you apart from the inside out and therefore make you of no use, no profit or help to the very noble intent of your care that you seem to care so much about. Did you get that? Did you understand that? No matter how much a father loves his son, he can do nothing for him if he's mentally or emotionally incapacitated or even dead. That father's love can do nothing for that child. Irma Bombeck, the late newspaper columnist and author, she said this. She said, worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do but never gets you anywhere. <laughs> I like that. But truthfully, I know that we'd be better off just resting in Christ, rocking in the Lord and trusting God with all of our cares. He knows what he's doing. You see, there's a carrot and stick deception that many people fall into. Follow me just for a second here because this is a religious trap. Your cares become the motivation to serve, sacrifice, push, give and give and give, to nobly worry. Oh, I'm nobly worrying. You're motivated by the reward of the carrot, which is your care being resolved, fixed, possibly helped. The stick in the metaphor is your guilt, your shame, your failure, your regret for not sacrificing still enough. I got, I got, I got, I got, I got to give more. So an unconscious belief begins to overtake your thinking and that belief steers your perception. Listen to this. If I sacrifice enough, then I'll be good. See, then I'll be wor worthy. Well, you see, that's a false belief against the truth of God's word. How about this one? If I just worry and care and bleed enough, I'll deserve to be loved. Well, well then you, you really wouldn't need Jesus. Well, if I can just serve and sacrifice a little more, then, you see, then I'll be somebody. Then I'll earn the right to be somebody. And then maybe God might bless me. Well, then why did God send Jesus if you could somehow serve and sacrifice enough to accomplish that? That you can somehow earn this childhood status of God. Many good, amazing people have been deceived into believing that their true identity, their self-worth is intrinsically tied to their performance of caring, worrying, fretting, serving. So unknowingly, unknowingly, they've exalted their sacrifice above the sacrifice of Jesus' work on the cross. Look, my friend, I've done it. I, I have to confess, I've done that. It's usually not a conscious decision. But when we choose to believe our caring is worth far more than Jesus caring, without realizing it, we let our sacrifice eclipse God's great love. Don't do that. Now the trap is sprung. Your heavy care on you makes it all about your performance, not Jesus' finished work. See, that's not humility. In fact, that's not trust. And it goes even step further. It's total deception and disorder. It's a lie. George Bernard Shaw, the famous playwright, he once said this. He said, people, he said, people become so attached to their burdens, sometimes more than the burdens are attached to them. You know what? He's right. Sometimes our burdens actually become part of our identity. That's not God's plan. That's not what God sent Jesus for. What you look at the longest 
becomes the strongest. Even if it's not, if you're not looking at God and you're looking at something else in your life, I'm talking about your perception, what you look at the longest, it becomes the strongest, even if it's a lie. So let's see when God's word tells us about how often we should focus on our cares and our worries and our stresses. I mean, they're so common and popular. I mean, God's word must tell us when's the right time that we should be anxious and worried and fretting, right? Well, look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Check this out. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Oh, I like that. You see, care and anxiety occupy the place in our heart that belongs to peace, prayer, and power. You can't focus on truth, activate love, and work your faith when you're disobediently laying in a, a field of care. You can't be thinking on what you're supposed to be meditating on, verse 8 of, of Philippians 4, which talks about whatever's true, honorable, and it gets into excellent things. You can't be meditating on that stuff when care has got a monopoly on the real estate of your mind. And that's what it wants to do. It's like a virus. It starts out small. Jesus says a little ferment leavens the whole lump. A little care will take over your whole mind. So what's Jesus have to say on the matter? Let's go to a Jesus conference, everybody. Come on. Let's go to a Jesus conference and see what he says about care and worry. The story's in Luke 10, and we start at verse 38. Now, you got to remember this. Jesus is going to his friend's place, Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And they're, they, they're quite wealthy. they got a nice big home, so quite a few people can come to it. He's on his way there. And so Jesus is entering this village, and, and we're going to pick up the story here as he's getting close to where the conference is taking place. And remember, Martha, she's been out there putting Jesus posters all over town, getting all the, the cookies ready. So here we go, starting at verse 38. Now, while they were on their way, it occurred that Jesus entered a certain village and a woman named Martha received and welcomed Jesus into her house. Well, that's special. Verse 39, And she had a sister named Mary who seated herself at the Lord's feet and was listening to his teaching. Hmm, this is Middle Eastern culture. That's unusual. Verse 40, But Martha, overly occupied and too busy, was distracted with much serving, and she came up to Jesus and said, Lord, is it nothing to you that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me to lend a hand to do her part along with me. I'm going to put in here a little extra that she should get worried and careful and anxious with me and get her butt busy and get going. Verse 41, but then the Lord replied to her by saying, Martha, Martha. Now, in, they say whenever in the Bible it says something twice, it means to the utmost extreme. So, utmost extreme. So, Jesus is exasperated with Martha. And he says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but only one thing is needed, for Mary has chosen the good part, that which is to her advantage, which will be not taken away from her. Oh, my goodness. When I read that as a boy, I thought, this is just not fair. But I was interpreting scripture from a place of being under, not over. I was feeling the pressure of care. So I was under the influence of care when I read that. I didn't realize that I was like Martha. My identity was all tied up in my care, my worry, my trouble. Even when it's based on a lie, it's hard to, to let go of because you develop muscle memory. Worrying can easily become a habit, a calling, a noble assignment, if you will, that we deceptively believe in. And Martha's arguing with Jesus about, you notice when people are under care, it's easy to start passing the love around. By that, I mean start passing the care pressure around. And she starts extending the pressure to Jesus. When you're worried and careful and fretful, you'll even start shoving on, pushing on God and trying to, instead of casting your care, you'll try to get God involved in the anxiety. Faith has a focus, just like worry has a focus. Mary had peace. Martha had pressure. And you know, when people have pressure from their cares and worries and anxiety, they get into something called 
pressure talk. They start getting into pressure talk. A lady, she wrote us one time after we were doing a family conference and she wanted to know how that she could stop yelling at her children, yelling at her husband, cussing the dog and feeling just plain miserable. You see, she was confessing that she was deeply caught in pressure talk and the root of that is care, worry, frustration, fear. When you're burdened with worry that you're not anointed to carry, remember, you're never going to be empowered by God to carry your, your own cares, worries, and frets. When you're burdened with that worry and care that you're not anointed to carry, it's going to always equal great pressure. Even though you love people, the pressure of care causes you to blow up. Here's what happens. You're quick to speak. You're slow to listen. You explode. You react. Sometimes you just shut down and you just tune out. You just go silent. You have no margin. You get a why me feeling. You need your man cave. You need your she shed. You take offense. You get under the influence of care. You just can't see good even when it's in front of you. You can't see Jesus even when Jesus is at the conference. You're so busy making Jesus cookies that you can't just enjoy the king of kings himself. Right? Martha couldn't enjoy Jesus, and she didn't want Mary enjoying Jesus. You walk blind to the blessings that are right there. You become unthankful. You feel so frustrated. Yes, you know it affects the way you feel physically, emotionally, mentally. You just stall. You end up crashing. We talked about this in part one, about the physical symptoms of care. There are physical symptoms to care, worry, and anxiety. For many people, their thought life is working day and night against them and not for them. Let's just take a quick look at Proverbs 4, verses 5 through 8. Here's what God's word says. It says, lean on, trust in and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and all your mind and do not rely on your own insight or understanding. You see, care is our own insight and our own understanding. Verse six, in all of your ways, know, recognize, acknowledge God and he will direct and make straight and plain your paths. That's a promise. That's a gift. Verse 7, don't be wise in your own eyes, but reverently fear and worship the Lord and turn entirely away from evil. Verse 8, it shall be health to your nerves, health to your sinews, your marrow, that, that's the place where your, your blood is created, and moistening to your bones. So you're going to have really good health when you do all this casting your care, when you receive this gift from God. Dr. Charles Mayo, he was one of the founders of the Mayo Clinic, very well-respected doctor, and he said this. He said, worry affects the circulation and the whole nervous system. He said, I've never known a man who died from overwork, but I've known many who have died from doubt. This is a respected physician and doctor who was groundbreaking in the field of medicine here in the United States. Let's remember this, some of the possible side effects of chronic stress and worry, high blood pressure, heart problems, type two diabetes, high cholesterol, headaches, depression and anxiety, skin conditions, asthma, arthritis. I mean, the list goes on and on. And speaking from experience, stomach ulcers, I've had them and then it leads to anemia. I've been there and I've done that. So. What would the great physician, Dr. Jesus, say to us right now in this context, in this conversation, right at this very second of time, what would he say to you being Dr. Jesus? Look at Matthew 6, verse 25. He would say this, stop being worried or anxious about your life. He's telling us, stop it. Stop all of it. Cares can be so important to us, even precious to us. And I understand that. I really do. I relate to you on that level. You see, when I heard that my mom had fallen and broken her hip and she was hurt so bad, oh, my friend, I care. When a mentor of mine who was like family to me was in a tragic car accident, yeah, I care. When I got a phone call about a close friend who's like a brother to me that he would never, ever be coming home again, because he drowned in a diving accident. Oh yeah, you want to believe it. Yes, I care. When my grandfather, the only real dad that I've ever had, 
that I've ever known was on his deathbed. Did I care? Yeah, I care. When someone who claims to be your close friend knifes you in the back, I've experienced that. Yeah, there's a temptation to care. When Pam's mom went in the hospital and the doctors had no answers, and I watched my precious wife lay beside her precious mom and weep, did I care? Yeah, I care a lot. But you see, there's no power in that care until I roll it over onto Jesus and activate the promise, activate the lifting power of God's hand. There's no power. There's no power to get me above the clouds to be a blessing to my mom, my wife, my friend, my friend's widow. There's no power to lift, to be exalted, to lift, to be able to help others. I need God's hand on my head, not the cares, not the care and worry. It keeps me down. It limits what I can do for others. Pam, she blew out her back when we were living in Nashville and the doctor said that there was no hope. We went to some of the top doctors in the country and they said that there was a good possibility that she would be in a wheelchair the rest of her life. Believe me, my friend, I paced the floors calling on God in the middle of the night because I cared, but I knew I had to cast that care, roll that care because I wouldn't be able to see the, the light, the promises. I wouldn't be able to see the direction of God if I didn't get the care off my mind. And as we began to do that over the next three, four months, God walked us through supernatural healing and also into his wisdom through the right people, through the right wisdom. And as we began to apply it in our lives and in Pam's life, Pam went from the doctor's um, diagnosis that she would be in a wheelchair to the point where she was up water skiing and horseback riding. I'm telling you, it's, it seems noble to care even for somebody like that and that you love so much. But as you let go and release the cares, God's power and his wisdom is activated in your life. You've got to speak the word. You've got to know how to self-talk. If you don't know how to do that, if you don't know how to tell yourself, hey, let go of the cares and receive God's promises, then you just go to Psalm 103 and you model after the psalmist David who talked to his soul and said, hey, no, bless the Lord, O my soul. Don't forget his benefits. That's what we've got to do. John Maxwell, he said this one time, he said, the person who forgets the ultimate becomes a slave to the immediate. You see, we all face times when we encounter trials that seem overwhelming. What will you do? Will you resort to worry and care? Is there a gift that will actually affect the outcome for good for your mom, your dad, your daughter, your son? What act of faith will actually move God's hand with power? I'm going to just tell you this short story. It's amazing. His name was Gunder Birkeland. He was born in Norway. At the age of two, he contracted polio. That's not a good prognosis. His parents put him in a wooden box and pulled him around in it because he couldn't walk, constantly surrounded with words of death, defeat, no hope of living a normal life. He began following Jesus at an early age, living in his little box. And at the age of seven, he was placed in front of the mirror and he saw himself standing in that mirror. He got a vision from Jesus and he began rocking back and forth in that box until he tipped that thing over. His parents heard the commotion. They put him back in the rock box, but he kept tipping over the box. They scolded him and even spanked him. I mean, they were caring for their, they were careful and caring for their son, but he had a vision from the Lord of him standing and he kept breaking out of the box. Before long, he began to crawl. He eventually began to walk. He outlived every member of his family oh, and became one of the 10 wealthiest people in the city of Seattle, Washington. He spent the rest of his life telling people that they don't have to live in the box. My friend, cast your care. It would have done Gunder no good to stay under his parents' care. He could have inherited his parents' care for his condition. I mean, he had polio. I mean, the only way that they could take care of him was to put him in a box. My friend, you're the one. Only you can take the lid. You're, only you have the authority to take the lid of care off your life 
and allow yourself to come under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. Let God exalt you. God's will, God's great gift for you, God's great joy for, me, for you. Come out of the box. Get out of the box permanently. Some of you feel guilty about having this great joy and this great peace from Father God. When responsibility demands you to be heavy with care, the accuser likes to feed you condemnation. Hey, you should be responsible and be under that care. Isn't this being careless? But it's about the empowerment of being free of care. Jesus said this in John 16, verse 22. He said, no one can take from you your great joy. That's like saying there's no circumstance that should take your great joy. It doesn't matter what's going on. You should stay in my great joy. As a slave to the immediate, you forget that the Lord Jesus is the Lord of all, that God is on the throne. As a slave to the immediate, you forget that the devil is already defeated. You get fooled and tricked into thinking that your sacrifice is somehow better than what Jesus did. That's just crazy, but we get fooled into it. God's gift for you today, the power on the other side of casting your care is 1 Peter Chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. He cares for you. My friend, Jesus is calling you to a rest. Jesus has rest for the weary. It's part of God's plan. It's not just for someone else. It's for you. That's what Jesus paid for. I'll end with this. Look at Matthew 11, verse 28 and verse 30. Jesus said, come to me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Carefree living is anointed, powerful living. It's yoke is easy, burden is light living. That's what God has for you. Hebrews 4 verse 11 says, let us labor therefore to enter into the rest. My friends, sometimes you've got to labor to cast the cares. Yes, sometimes you've got to do it once, twice, maybe 10 times in a day, but you just keep trusting the Lord and labor. Lord, I'm going to just keep putting it. I'm not going to allow this thing to be on my head and in my head. I'm casting my cares over in you. I want to be under your hand. You see, nobody can do this for you. This requires your vote of confidence, your trust in God. Do you trust God? Oh, oh, Pastor Stephen, you know I, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. But that's not what I'm asking you. Do you trust the Lord? Remember, you're the one that's got to give up in order to go up. So what do we do to practically apply this? How do we honor God with 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7? How do you do this? Well, you've got to take action because you know faith that isn't put to work, is, it's dormant. Faith without works is dead. You got to take action. You must take action to trigger this gift exchange. To deal with care, worry, fear, you must take action. You can't be passive about it. You have to be activated. You cannot reason care away. You cannot fight thoughts with thoughts. The weapons of your warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. But you got to open your mouth and you got to say so. That's why it says, hold fast to the profession of your faith. So here's a starting place. The very beginning is you've got to know the will of God. 1 Peter 5, verse 6 and 7, commit it to memory. Me saying it is one thing, but your heart repeating those words to you over and over. Oh, my friend, it's going, to, it's going to renew your mind and transform you. That's what Romans 12 verse 2 says. You see, you act on what you believe. So know the will of God. Know the will of God for your life. Accept that God's way, His will is right. His plan is best. It's the power connection for your life. You can't do this without faith, and faith comes by hearing God's word. Resist the devil, and that doesn't mean tolerate condemnation in your thinking. You've got to know the will of God. Now, next, you've got to trust in God. Well, what's that look like? You see, God has good plans for you, but it doesn't matter how good those plans are if they don't get activated. If you don't trust, see, they get activated when you trust in God. That's throwing the switch. Otherwise, they remain inactive. Admit the wrong of carrying your own care. 
The world doesn't understand, but it's pride to do that. This is where you honestly consider what your cares are, articulate them by making a decree, a confirmation, a witness that this is what I'm entrusting. I've entrusted to this to Jesus. Every time it comes up in your mind, then you got to say, I've already entrusted that to God. So trust God by trusting in his will. And then the third step that I use frequently, this is something I practice all the time. Use care Use it as a trigger for your faith focus. So what, what's that mean? What your mind, what, what's your mind supposed to be stayed on? Well, Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, You, God, will keep him in perfect peace. You will keep Stephen in perfect peace when his mind is stayed on you because Stephen trusts in you. You got to know the word of God, right? You got to constantly use. So if a care and a worry comes along, I, I put that aside and I said, what's God's word say? What's God's word? See, we talked earlier, earlier about Philippians 4 verse 8 telling us, in conclusion, believers, think on whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, beautiful, admirable, whatever is excellent, praiseworthy. You got to center those thoughts in your mind. Well, that means every time a care comes along, instead of taking it, I give it to Jesus. And right away, I'm thinking, what's true? What's honorable? You know, even what's applicable to this thing trying to provoke care, maybe it's a concern about somebody, I turn it into a prayer. Father, I thank you that by Jesus' stripes, you know, Mary is healed. I speak it, and I'm going to just cast the care of it and thank you that you're taking care of this thing. You see, when your mind is fixed and stayed on all the faith assignments that God the Father gives us, the truth is we don't have time to worry. So use the temptation of care as a trigger for your faith focus. Why don't you right now just take a minute, bow your head. You've got to act on what the Holy Spirit is doing in your heart right now. I believe the Holy Spirit's ministering to you. Let me lead you in a prayer of surrender where you can take all of your worries, all of your cares, some of them so precious to you, and just entrust them to God who so loves you and also loves the people that you so deeply care about. Why don't you do this? Pray this after me. If you want to just let go and go up and allow God to help you up so that you can be more of a blessing. Pray this. Father, forgive me for the sin of worry. I repent of not trusting you. I release all my cares now into your hands. Jesus, You told me to come to you and that you would give me rest. That means I change my mind. I repent of my old thinking. Instead of thinking fear thoughts, now I meditate on your promises. I'm going to trust in you from now on. Fill my heart with love, joy, and peace. You've overcome the world from me. I choose your lifting power, your anointing to overcome. In Jesus' name, now say this, I will not be shaken anymore. Oh, I'll say it again. I will not be shaken anymore. Amen. What a powerful confession of your faith. Now you got to, like I said before, you got to hold fast to that profession of faith. We have all kinds of more in-depth encouragement on our website to help you grow and continue to live life strong. God has new gifts for you all along your journey as a child of God. So always be looking and expecting new levels of faith as you pursue His glory in your life. God has an endless supply of mercy, joy, peace, goodness, and on and on. And oh, His love, right? There is no way you can ever measure His unlimited, unfailing love. 